Well, we are going to be in chapter 12, verse 4, picking up today. I think what we're going to do, uh, maybe do a little review, but then just go through the, all the gifts so we kind of establish them. I know you've heard them before. We've talked about them before. You've talked about them in church and Sunday school, different places. We're just kind of identify them so we kind of have a, a, a go-to reference. And then next week we'll get back into the context of what is being said in chapter 12. I'm going to pray and then we'll, we'll get started. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We do thank you so much for the chance to meet here. We thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to be in the body of Christ and to be saved, to have an eternal home, but also, Father, at this time in history to have an opportunity to grow and mature and to actually have gifts that are supernatural that we are empowered with that we may serve others and do the things you've called us to. We ask that we may learn more about this, that we would embrace them, that we would develop them and, and then use them in our life as far as ministry to other people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of things I just mentioned there as I was praying was one is we all have these gifts and to identify these gifts uh, they are, I like to think of them as more as personality traits, although they come from God, more than natural talents, although they come from God. These are supernatural endowments for the believer. After the new birth, after you've been born again, these are endowments, a, a supernatural manifestation. And sometimes it's so common, or we get our definition of supernatural so strange and mystical that we, we miss what God has done. You know, you get saved. And, and you're born again, the Spirit indwells you, and now He's called you to a certain ministry at some level. And it, it's so natural in your growing process that sometimes you look in the mirror and go, I just don't know what my gift is. And sometimes your gifts, they are supernatural, but sometimes they fit your personality, they fit your gifts, and it's so easy for you that you don't, you don't recognize it as a gift. Uh, you know, any, or you expect to be some supernatural splashy thing where you can take and wave your hand and all these people fall down as a demonstration of, of something. I, you know, that leads us to the next point. All of these gifts are for the benefit of the, the body of Christ. They help other people. They assist. They empower. They encourage. They help bring about the manifestation of God's purpose in the church in a greater dimension. And again, it's hard to judge them and say that's good or that's bad or, or to say that's necessary or that's not necessary. That's where the Corinthians are getting into trouble. They're, they're kind of saying, well, that's not necessary or that's not good. And Paul's saying they're all needed. They all come from the same spirit. And so one of the themes, again, is diversity is we're all different, we've all got different gifts, but it's all the same spirit doing the same purpose. And he, Paul's going to compare it to a body, and it's like you don't just have an eyeball or just have a foot. Your eyeball needs your foot, your foot needs your eyeball, and all, everything goes in between to make the body function. <clears throat> so sometimes there may not be a lot of fellowship between the foot and the eyeball, but they are part of the body. And I think we need to be careful of that too, even in the church, is we are all a body doing the same thing. And there may be people in the body of Christ doing certain things that God has empowered them to do to bring about the purpose, but they're over on that part, side of the body. They're doing something over there. I don't necessarily have to be socially connected to them and be best friends and go out to eat with them to function as a body. You understand what I'm saying? We all don't have to be like one big happy social group to be a functioning body. We have to be a functioning body as far as working together, doing our parts, not, not rejecting each other, but yet at the same time working together. Another point is these gifts, and I think this is a very important idea here, is, is they, Paul says desire them, and even says desire uh, the best gifts. So in other words, it, it almost gives, we know they come from the Spirit of God, but Paul is saying go after them. It's like, well, I don't know what gift I've got. Well, what gift do you wish you had? What gift appeals to you? Well, this is kind of appeal. Well, go after it, desire it. And so there's, not that God's going to then give it to you, but it may be that you, you need to go off and actually show some sign of aggression. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, I'm just passing going to receive this gift. It's like, well, it's already been given. It's your turn now to go and desire, go off and find out what it is. Which leads to the next point, and that is the development of the gift. You, I, I see throughout this, and I've, I've experienced my own life, and I'm sure you have too, is you have a gift or you have a desire, you find the gift. Well, now, and I've said this to so many people, send me emails and say, you know, I want to be a Bible teacher. <clears throat> or I feel called to be involved in some kind of teaching or ministry of some sort. And, and the first thing I always tell them, they say, what, what do I do? I says, start practicing. Start doing it. And I, I, it started for me way back many years ago of just finding a class to teach. And really, that's the basis of my ministry is just keep creating classes, you know. And you, you think you're a Bible teacher? I feel called to teach. Well, start teaching. Well, I, I, I can't find a church that will let me teach. I can't. I don't know where. It's like, well, hang up a sign. Have someone come over. Open the Bible. 
or Galatians chapter 1. And start teaching. What if they don't come back? Well, try it again. You know, do it better next time. And, just, and eventually you just, and I've experienced it, <coughs> and some of you maybe witnessed it over the years, is you, you begin to develop a gift. I mean, you, you've got the gift, but you, you need to develop the gift that you've been given. It's not just some kind of, again, <coughs> man, Tony, I'm going to need a drink of water of some sort. I'm not sure how hard that's going to be. <coughs> um, it, it, you see supernatural gifts, like maybe on TV where someone lays hands on a sick person and then they fall over. It's like, well, that, how hard is that? You know, you touch them, all oh, it looks like that. And you think all the gifts should be like supernatural explosions. Well, a lot of times we look back at them, they're, they're developed, they're practiced as you continue to go. And you get better with them, you learn how to flow with God better. <coughs> and it says that in Galatians chapter 4, or for, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's going to say that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Which means, again, we're going to look at it several different ways. But the gift you have is subject to you. And you, you can turn it on and you can turn it off. I, and I, I'm a strong believer in this. If, if you have a gift, God has given it to you to serve the body of Christ. It's not, he may urge you, he may, you may feel the, the unction, you may feel the encouraging of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> but what's going to happen is, you're going to have to be the one that initiates it. Or, if it's the inappropriate time, to shut it off. Paul's going to say in chapter uh, 14, he's going to say, if one of the speakers is speaking, the others should stop. In other words, <coughs> if there's someone prophesying or giving a tongues or an interpretation or a teaching, what should the other ones do? Well, I've got one too. Shh, they're not finished. Or if someone else has a manifestation of the Spirit and you're taking up all the time, maybe you, it says... The first speaker needs to be quiet and let the second speaker talk. In other words, you see right there, there's nowhere in here where the spirit comes on somebody and they go into like the zombie state and they can't help themselves because they're being driven. That, that's called demon possession. You know, whenever the spirit says he's working in you. So you've always got this gift. You turn it on, you shut it off. You develop it or you neglect it. You work with others along with your gift. Or you overwhelm or you don't use it at all. Somehow you've got to balance it. So it's going to be your gift that you call on and call off. <clears throat> and then there's no re reason in there where it doesn't eliminate the idea that the Spirit of God can come on you for a supernatural manifestation at a certain time. And, and it's, it's not available at other times. So, well, let's go ahead and look in chapter, uh, well, let's look at chapter 12. I'm going to read down through verse 11 again. And uh, maybe jump into verse, yeah, chapter 13, just a little bit there, just kind of read through, through this. <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 1. Now about spiritual, and I get spiritual gifts, spiritual manifestations, I'm saying that says because that's in the neuter or the masculine, I'm going to go with spiritual people, and that's, that's appropriate too. Spiritual things or spiritual people. I think Paul's identifying now about spiritual people, brothers. I do not want you to be ignorant. I do not want you to be ignorant about what is truly spiritual. What does a spiritual person look like? And the answer to that comes, chapter 13. This is a spiritual person. A spiritual person is not someone with a spiritual gift because everyone's got a spiritual gift. What makes a spiritual person? It's chapter 13. Not everyone has developed love. Not everyone has developed their spiritual gift <coughs> where they are serving other people. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for my lovely assistant. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so chapter 13 is really the pivot point of this whole teaching. We're kind of leaving that subject day and focusing on the individual gifts. But just because you've got a spiritual gift, you shouldn't go, wow, look how impressive I am. I've got a spiritual gift. It's like, yeah, everybody's got a spiritual gift. But are you using that spiritual gift to serve others? Or are you using it to serve yourself? Are you using it to benefit and advance the purpose of Christ in the body of Christ? Or are you using it to advance your own agenda? Love is going to be focused on others, not themselves. So anyway, chapter 12, verse 1. Now about spiritual people, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. <clears throat> you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were led influenced and led astray by mute idols. So in other words, when you were pagans, uh, again, I'm sorry, this has become the pagan side. When I point like this, this is the pagan side. It's been like, wait a minute, I've got people sitting there now, so do not think I'm associated. That's the pagan, that's where the temples are in my mind. This is the Christian side over here. It's just been that way for months, and so you're sorry. <laughs> uh, so in other words, when they were living, when they were manifesting our spirits in the, and demons in the temple, they had spiritual manifestations. So it's like, it's no big deal to manifest a spiritual manifestation because you were doing that in the pagan temples. 
Therefore, I tell you that no one who speaks by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, but only can say, Jesus Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Again, what does this all mean? Jesus be cursed? In other words, it's the content. What is the purpose? Is it the Spirit of God doing something beneficial, glorifying Jesus Christ? Or is it taking something away from and, and, and neglecting it? Or we did see that possibly when it says, Jesus be cursed. That, that was a practice in the pagan temples of where they would take their gods and they were only one reason that they would go to their gods was to get blessings from their god, to be in good faith. They'd offer sacrifices to their gods so they'd have good favor with their gods. And while they're there, they'd ask their gods to curse their opposition or their enemies. So they were going to God for one reason. If you want to know, if you want to identify pagan worship and Christian worship, here it is. <clears throat> pagan worship goes to God to get blessings and eliminate the opposition. Bless me and curse these other people. Work for me. Can I get you to work on my side? Okay? Christianity goes to God to glorify and recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. And how can we be of service to bring that message to the world? And that's the whole of these chapters 12, 13, and 14. Is we're all here serving each other, helping the body of Christ advance. Well, no, we're here to get blessings and make sure we have the advantage and have a good life and everything works out. It's like, yeah, you're, you are like right there. You may be using Jesus, you may be carrying your Bible, but you're worshiping like a pagan. I mean, that's, that's flat out the definition. If a pagan goes to God to get what they want and to eliminate their opposition, a Christian goes to God to glorify Jesus Christ and how can I be of service? Every time you see these guys, these authors in the New Testament identify themselves, they call themselves what? Servants of Jesus Christ. A doulos. I am a bond servant. I am committed to his program. What does he want me to do? Well, he's going to have you go over here, witness, and be martyred. Yeah, that's not what I want to do. It's like that's that's going to that's what he needs the servant to do right now, and that's the whole idea. And anyway, you can see right here in chapter twelve, verse three. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed. In other words, neglects Jesus or uses Jesus for their own advantage. But instead, speaking by the Spirit of God, they say, uh, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. In other words, your life, your message, your gift is saying, Jesus is Lord. We are here to serve him. We're helping his body grow and mature. So that Paul basically answers the question right there. Now, verse 4. There, there, are many different ki- there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. And this is where he begins to kind of begin his argument against their problem, is they're diversifying, they're breaking down. These are the important gifts, these are the the, the not important gifts, these are people that are pooling up in their own areas. He's saying there's got to be diversity, but they've got got to be unified in purpose. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them and all men. So it's pretty clear what's being said right there. There's, these are different, but it's the same gift or the same God. These are different, but it's the same Lord. These are different, but it's the same spirit. We're, we're going to be different, but we're all going the same direction. Okay, verse 7. Now, to each one, as you know, very important line, each one, that means everyone. In fact, that's emphatic in the Greek. It begins right there. Everyone. What's the important part in the Greek sentence right here? Everyone's got this. You're not special. If you were a believer, you've got one. So don't stand at all. Oh, look, they've got a manifestation of the Spirit. They've, they've got a spiritual gift. Everyone's got that. Which means just because you've got one doesn't mean you're special. Just because you've got one doesn't mean you're spiritual. Or just because you've got one doesn't mean you're operating, in chapter 13, that you're operating in love. Just because you're operating in a spiritual gift doesn't mean you're manifesting love or the nature of God. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Why? For the common good. It's not given for any other reason except to help strengthen and advance the purpose of the church. To one. Now he's going to give you a list of nine things. And on your notes from previous weeks, uh, I've got a list of there like nine or ten different ways of grouping these. There's nine of them. And here's, here they are. Message of wisdom to another. The message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit to another. Faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the, by the one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different <coughs> kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, there's, there's a list. Now, what does that list mean? That cannot be exhausted. Now, you've, you've, I'll make statements, as always. You've got to judge my statements with the Word of God, with previous teachings you've got, with your own understanding. But right here, this list of nine gifts... Why is this given? It's not exhaustive. It's, not, it's in some kind of an order. There's some purpose why Paul chose these. 
It's not just completely random, although it appears fairly close to being random. This may be because these are the gifts that they're, they're manifesting in Corinth, the ones that they're having trouble with. Uh, it may be that he's got some categories, maybe three or four different categories he's trying to pick samples from. It may, he may, he, it may be he's trying to get a, a rainbow of selection, but, if, by say, but, but when I say a rainbow of a wide range of selections, there's some very basic gifts here that he's leaving out that would be nice to have included in this. So again, I've given you on the, on the notes like ten different ways of breaking this down. Um, but I'll read verse 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Now that's really his point. It's not so much which gifts he chooses, <laughs> but that he's chosen some gifts, and it's, it's a sampling of something, maybe of a diversity. But he, his point in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Look how different they are, but it's the same exact Spirit who's <laughs> giving those, <clears throat> using those to do his purpose. And he gives them to each one, again, there it is again, like we began in verse, verse, verse 7. He gives them to each one, <coughs> meaning everyone has one, as he determines. He's, he's calling the shots. Every one of you is a part of it. And where you're placed in the body <coughs> was his choice, was his decision. You're a part of this body, and you've all got a gift. And it, it's, it's different. It's a wide range. Never had trouble putting a lid on before but where you're standing in front of people, everything's different. <laughs> okay, uh, now, chapter 12, or chapter 12, verse 12. I'm going to quit, but I just want to read in where we're going with this. The body is a unit. So this is his point. He's kind of giving us some background now. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though it is all the parts are many, they form one body, so it is with Christ, so as it is with Christ. So he's going to be talking about unity, unity the idealist diversity. Now, I'd like to do right now is I'd like to go back to verse 8, and if you look on your notes <clears throat> from the previous week, or if Tony gave them to you today, I'm not even sure what page. Can someone tell me what page it is? I've got, I just print off some, a new set of notes. All right. Page 5? Where, we, where I, it says chapter 12, verse 9, 12, 10. Yeah. That's page 5. Okay, on the old notes, it's page 5. So here we've got... <clears throat> The first thing we've got is word of wisdom and word of knowledge. And, and once again, this I'm going I'm to give you some background. You already know something about these things. I'm going to add to it a little bit, maybe clarify some things, give you more to think about. But it is hard to just come down and say this is exactly what he's talking about because he says word of wisdom. And it's like you can become dogmatic about that, but really being dogmatic about saying I know exactly what it means without leaving yourself open to other suggestions, it means you're kind of being narrow-minded because you're working with two Greek words, logos, sophia. And what does that mean? It's like you're going to have to grab scriptural examples of which there may not be very many. Uh, we, we don't know. we got early church interpretation, but sometimes they're even grabbing and guessing what Paul's referring to. We assume the Corinthians understood what he's talking about. So here we go. <clears throat> the word logos, both in, in the first and second one, logos of wisdom and logos of knowledge, or logos sophia, logos gnosko. But logos, it means this right here. It's a it, basic translation is the word or word. It, is, it means rational expression or reason thought. Now, this is important. I just was reading this in a book by a pagan, an atheist, actually coming against church history, but it's a great, great, uh, it's a great book written very academically. It just comes against the church. But uh, he says in here that this that even in the when the Greeks would do, <clears throat> and as you know, the Greeks were great in doing research and, and, and thinking and writing about mathematics or writing about thought or philosophy or government, and they, they put these bodies of work together, and those would be called all their all their facts, this is their document. They would call it the logos. This is the logos of what we've just discussed. It's almost like a term paper or a research paper. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's your information. Now remember, in John chapter 1, uh, John begins to describe Jesus Christ as the eternal word, as the word became flesh. And that is the word logos. And if I can add this, or say this this way, he's not talking about a word as much as the word would, is used as the rational expression. This is the embodiment of truth that God has from eternity past this is his research paper on truth. This is his research paper on reality. This is his documentation on the word. And all of a sudden, all that information, John is saying, in, in, in the Greek, that's what he's saying. 
this rational expression, this documentation, this, this gathering of all the information of the eternal knowledge of God, it became flesh. I mean, it's like, whoa, not just random word, and not just, again, be careful, not just this, not just, you know, what's written down between these, these, in these pages, but all of God, the expression of God, some of it's been revealed to us in written text, but there's things out there. It's called the mysteries of God. We don't understand certain things. Paul talks about mysteries. They haven't been revealed. Sometimes Paul gets to a wall where he explains it the best he can. And he says, it's a mystery. And then he backs away from it. Because there's things in that Logos that haven't been communicated to mortal man. Well, anyway, that Logos became flesh and walked among us. And John was completely amazed by that. So with that understanding, we look at this again. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given... Through the Spirit, the message, and in the NIV it translates that as a message, logos of wisdom to another, the logos of knowledge. <clears throat> so now you've got the logos of knowledge or wisdom, the logos of, of knowledge. Wisdom <coughs> is the word Sophia. <coughs> it gives the impression of something more like insight, application. I use it in school. I use it in school on Friday. I don't, I don't teach Christianity in, in the public school. Although some of the signs hanging in the hallways in the, Christian, in, the public, in the public school are very similar to a lot of sermon titles in churches today, uh, which is my slam in some of the churches today, if you don't mind me saying that. Because either the, either the public school is becoming Christian, because some of the signs and models we've got hanging in the hallways are exactly the same title sermons I see in churches. So I guess we're all becoming Christian schools. Or are the churches becoming pagan? <laughs> yeah, I just leave that there as an insult. But uh, <clears throat> I have kids working on several modules or stations in the shop. And one of them is they're shaping plastic. They heat plastic up and they bend it. And they sand it. They make little tech, they little skateboards. And they take them to other people's classes and skate around them on their desk and stuff. and have them taken away from them. Oh, yeah, I, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. But there, it's, it's all good. But every year, it gets me very excited as the as 12 and 13 year olds come down and they start making these tech decks. They can bend and make picture frames and stuff. And, 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 and knowledge, and I, I explain this, I, every year this happens. I went into the group, there's a bunch of guys back there working, there's some girls there working. And uh, I said, hey, I said, now let me just, before, this, before I lose control of this, I just want to tell you that if you have knowledge, if you have creativity, if you are thinking, Common sense is going to tell you, you know what? If I take this plastic, I can, I can grind it down to a point, and I can sharpen it over here on the buffing wheel, I can make a plastic blade. I can make a knife. I says, now be careful. Is that bad? Is that evil? Or is that using creativity? Is that using your knowledge? They says, whoa. And they're all like, uh, are we being set up here? Yes, you are. <laughs> and they says, uh, some, some boys went like, uh, no, that's you shouldn't. Some are like, hmm, I think it's okay. You know? And it's like, I says, yeah. I says, there's any normal person after spending a couple days here grinding and shaving plastic is going to think, you know what? I can make a weapon. I says, if you haven't thought that, what's wrong with you? You can make a weapon with this. That's knowledge. That's good. You're thinking. But now, there's another thing besides knowledge. There's wisdom. Would it be wise to make a knife in shop class and take it out of the hallways and sell them to the other kids? That might be knowledge. It might be a smart thing to do, but would it be a wise thing to do? And then university, I've got this. No. I says, no. You'd be using knowledge in a very foolish way. You'd be very smart and very creative, but you'd be a fool and you'd get punished. Now, there's nothing wrong with making a blade, nothing wrong with making a knife, but in a public school right now today, no. So there's an example I used of knowledge, Sophia of knowledge, Sophia of wisdom, or excuse me, Logos of, of Gnosko and Logos of Sophia. And of course, I asked, do you understand? And they all understood. Because sometimes you get those confused. It's like, it's evil to make a knife. No, it's not evil to make a knife. It's creative. It, it takes knowledge. But what is evil is when is it appropriate, when is it not appropriate? And now we get into this, I think, chapter, chapter 12, verse 8. To one that's given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, Sophia. That, that, that's, that's not knowledge. That's Sophia. That's timing. That's appropriateness. That's what's, what's going on in this situation. 
You see it in the Bible. Sometimes things that are appropriate at a certain time in the Bible are, are commended and praised that this is the way everyone should be. And then you go a few chapters later or a story or two later, and someone does the exact same thing, and they're reprimanded for it. It's like, well, I thought you were supposed... I, I don't understand as well. Wisdom would say this was the appropriate time to do this thing. <clears throat> this was the inappropriate time. <clears throat> so the, the Logos of Sophia, in the Logos of God, timing is important. Solomon writes it. There's a time for everything under the sun. There's, a, there's an appropriate place for everything. Sometimes there's time to pick up stones, sometimes to scatter. Sometimes there's time to go to war, sometimes there's time to have peace. There's a place for everything. Don't get locked in step where you, sir, this is evil. Well, no, sometimes that what you call as evil is appropriate at the right time. That's Sophia, or, or Logos of Sophia. And then likewise, then the message of knowledge would be the Logos of Gnosko. That's information, that's knowledge. Sometimes it's experiential knowledge, if you want to put the word epinosis along with, with Gnosko. So that's what they have right there. Now, what is that message of wisdom, message of knowledge? <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's given by the Spirit. Is it supernatural? As you're walking down the street, what else, and it just hits upside the head? It could be just a, you know, a, someone interrupts a church service and, and presents a message of, of knowledge or a message of wisdom. It could be some supernatural manifestation, if you want to go that way. Go charismatic, go Pentecostal, and there's got to be some kind of like a movement, a wave of the Spirit going through. And you know, you know, I'm just standing here, and all of a sudden I don't know anything else. And Bruce, I've got a word for, from God. It, it could be that. Or it could be, just like we're going to see later on as we go through this, we're going to see gifts of pastor, gifts of teacher. Uh, gifts of evangelism. And those are not so much waves that, you know, you're just out, you know, one day you're this and this wave blows through and all of a sudden you start teaching, now I'm done, it just blew through me. It, it, it's more as a lifestyle, it's something that you develop, you practice. And so right here, I would like to even present here, this can be people who have a supernatural gift. Uh, it can be a message on, on a timely basis, or it could just be they have supernatural insight into knowledge and information. That's beneficial to the church. But others alongside of them can come along and say, yes, now we're into like stories about, again, not using the same thing, but we talk about in 2 Samuel with Ahithophel and Hushai, and these are the counselors of David. They came alongside of him and gave him advice. This would be the right time, this would be the good time. Uh, how would we work this? And they're giving more, not so much information, but why would this information work now, or why is this information inappropriate now? Uh, more of a timing thing, again, insight. So instead of just wisdom, it would be insight. So those are two gifts right there. Once again, I, how do you describe those? You can describe them differently. You've got to use those Greek words as your foundation. But as far as when do they take place, how do they take place, how supernatural are they, or how natural are they? But bottom line, the church of Jesus Christ needs those gifts, and some people have them, and they need to be used at the right time. Next, it says... By means of the same Spirit, verse 9, to another, faith by the same Spirit. Now, you're going to see it over and over throughout. This is the same Spirit. In other words, Paul is stressing the diversity. This is really the context here. The diversity of all of these gifts, but yet the unity of the same Spirit needing you to do this. I need you to do this. I need you to do this. You may not get along or understand each other, but the same Spirit is using all of you to accomplish His purpose. This one is the, another gift of faith. Now, if you go to chapter 13, verse 2. And uh, I should probably read this right now, chapter 13, verse, I'm going to read 1, 2, and 3. Because in chapter 13, as I said, Paul comes down and he begins to answer the question, who is the spiritual person? Who, who are they? They're not the one with the spiritual gift, because everyone's got that. The spiritual person is the one who can mature in spirituality and ultimately manifest love in their life, which is service to others through Jesus Christ. Or it is, it is hope, it is, it is faith, it is continuing to do what God has called you to do. Well, here we go, chapter 13. Here's a list of gifts, but he's now, now in chapter 13, verse 1 through 3, he lists the gifts, but then in a sense negates them, saying, you can have this gift, but if you're not mature, if you're not spiritual, you, don't be impressed. You're, you're nothing. You're, you're, just because you've got a spiritual manifestation. I mean, a pagan can manifest a demonic spirit. Wow, how good is that? It, it's worthless. Well, here it is. Chapter 13, verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, okay, and that's, that's uh, talking about the gift of tongues, we'll talk about that quite a bit here in a little bit, not today, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. You're just a noisemaker. In other words, you're not really serving the purpose you were intended for. You know, like an instrument, you ever had a kid get a, uh, begin practicing an instrument? We went through the saxophone, we went through the drums, we went through the trumpet, we went through piano, and it's like, 
<clears throat> until they know what they're doing, it's kind of like, what is that sound? That's my son practicing. Oh my gosh. It's like, stop. Because you're not serving a purpose. And the purpose of the gifts is love. The purpose of the gift is to help and advance the purpose of Christ. There's a purpose to it. But if you are not serving that purpose, if you're not playing a song, if you're not playing part of the melody, you're just in the background making noise that's driving us all crazy. So stop. Go down to the basement. Do something. Switch. It. Put, stop playing the drums at least. Play the flute or something. Okay. Sorry. That came from some bad personal experiences. <laughs> Okay, so if I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, if I'm not playing the tune, I'm only a, a resounding gong or clanging cymbal or a son banging on the drums in the basement. It's worthless. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I think right here, prophecy, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, those are three different things. We'll break them down. Prophecy, we'll talk about that quite a bit as we go through here. Uh, fathom all mysteries. Now, that's interesting. There's another gift. We talked about Paul coming to that edge of, or any of us coming to that edge of what has been revealed, of the Logos that's been revealed to mankind. We've got it in nature. We've got it in the Word. But eventually you're going to come to that line of like, can you explain the Trinity to me again? It's like, uh, I can talk all about it. I can talk all around it. But when I get done, I really don't know what I said. Because you've got these three people who are not individuals, but they're the same. But yet they're one God, but there's three of them. They can talk to each other, but they're the same person. Not really, though, not the same person. There's three different people, but the same substance, essence. What did you just say? I don't know what I just said, but I'm, I'm, I'm describing the Trinity. Now, again, you can, you can spend a lot of theological work on it, but the more you talk about the Trinity, the closer you become to a heretic. It's better to make a very simple statement and back away. So that's all I'm going to say, because if you talk any longer, you just become a heretic. It's like, I didn't know, I didn't know I was a heretic, because it's, it's a mystery. How can you have three in one? Now, I believe in the Trinity. I accept the Trinity, but that's just one. Or end times. We all know about end times. We talk about eschatology. But understand, it hasn't happened yet. And when it does happen, it's going to be like, huh, I didn't see that coming. Yeah, it's right here. It's very clear. Yeah, that's exactly what it says. Why didn't I understand that? The same reason when Jesus walked in, he is the Messiah walking on Palm Sunday. He says, here I am on this day. I was supposed to come. And you really shouldn't reject me because if you reject me, it's really going to be. And they says, you're, you're unbiblical, you're unscriptural, you're not at all what we we're looking for in a Messiah, we're going to have to kill you. I know, but I'm, and, I, and the disciples look back and they go, that's exactly what the Bible says. And no one saw it coming. They studied it, they waited for him, they're looking for him, and he walked in on the, the other door. It's like, well, that's the wrong, that's like, that's, ex it was a mystery. So be careful with eschatology. In other words, I'm rambling here again. Let's get back to the text. I'm in verse 13, explaining chapter 12. Chapter 13, explaining chapter 12. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels and have that love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, and that would be right there. You come to that edge, and all of a sudden you have the ability, the Spirit is giving you extra insight to be able to look out there and bring some of those mysteries back and explain them. I think guys like C.S. Lewis or some of the other great teachers that you know in, in history, where they're up there and they say these things that's like, wow, I wish I could have said that. Or it takes me an hour to say, C.S. Lewis can say it in like, you know, five words. It's like, yeah, what C.S. Lewis says in five words is so much better than what Galen said, you know, in three weeks. And, and I understand what C.S. Lewis said. I never did understand what Galen was saying. And so that's that idea of fathoming all, be able to bring that stuff in. And all knowledge. And if I have faith, now here's what I'm looking at right here. The reason I'm here is for the word faith. And if I have faith, <clears throat> now over in chapter 12, it just says faith, the gift of faith, and then moves on. There's no, no describers. It's just faith. What is faith? And there's a variety of types of faith. Look at this one. Now he appears to put a little definition. A faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. We'll come back to this next verse 3 here in a little bit. But now this faith, and now it's a faith that is described here as it can move mountains. So I'm going to go back to chapter 12, or excuse me, yeah, chapter 12, uh, uh, verse, verse uh, what, where are we in? Verse 8, verse 9, to another faith by the same Spirit. This is a supernatural gift. This is a gift of the Spirit. I, and you don't have to agree with me, but I'm going to start making some qualifying statements. One, this is not faith of salvation. This uh, Getting saved by faith, trusting in Jesus Christ, is not a spiritual gift that's listed right here. This is something that takes place as a Christian. You are a Christian, and you're going to be given faith. Now, we know faith comes from hearing the word. The more you understand, you're growing in your, like we're reading 2 Peter now on Tuesday nights. 
You grow in the grace and faith. You grow through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The more you understand, the more you wrap your mind around things, the more you, you have a, a exposed to that logos, the greater your faith is going to be. The more grace you can receive to continue to grow in your faith and manifest the nature of Jesus Christ. That's another type of faith. But that faith comes from growth and understanding in the Word of God. So you've got salvation by faith. You hear the gospel. You believe. You advance into the kingdom of God. You hear the teaching of the Word of God. You grow in your faith. You grow in the grace. You receive greater understanding. And you have a greater faith. That's from the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, I don't think that's what we're talking about. This, I think, especially when you put it in, the, in the chapter 13, faith that can move mountains. This is, I believe, be, you know, judge me, is a supernatural manifestation that not everybody has. Everybody has the opportunity to receive salvation by faith. Everyone has the opportunity to grow in their faith as they hear the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But a few individuals are going to be given a, an endowment of faith. Uh, uh, the ability to see and understand something and be able to stand their ground until that mountain is no longer there. It's like a lot of people see the mountain and go, well, we can't go that way and, and go somewhere else. But there's going to come an individual in the church community, you know, locally or university, that's going to come to the mountain and say, yeah, that mountain is in the wrong place. And that mountain's going to move. Well, what are we going to do? Well, there might be a variety of ways of moving the mountain, but that person or a group of people are going to be able to, for the, not for themselves, and say, and look what great faith I've got. I moved the mountain. They're going to be able to gather a community behind them and look at that mountain and say, and begin to encourage, strengthen these people that we're going to stand here until that mountain is no longer there. And then we'll progress with the church. And that is the faith that we're talking about. It's not the faith of salvation. It's not the faith of growing and maturing in Christ. It's the faith. Now, we all don't have it. A lot of people look at the mountain and say, that mountain's been there forever and go this way. That's okay because that, you're not responsible for that mountain. But there's going to be someone's going to come along and God says, you're in charge of that mountain. You're going to have the faith and you're not going to take your eye off the mountain. You ever met those people that just keep talking about the same thing over and over and over again? Sometimes they've got a social problem, but sometimes they're looking at the mountain. It's like, I, just, I, keep, I wake up every morning looking at that mountain. Well, we've all turned away from that mountain. I don't. I keep looking at that mountain. We need to talk more about this mountain. And they gather, they keep moving. Pretty soon, that mountain's gone. It's like, how that mountain? And then everybody takes credit for it and stuff. But it was God through one person that kept looking at that mountain, if you understand what I'm saying. So I think, when you look at this right here in verse, verse 8, to one that is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. All Paul says here is faith by the same Spirit. I jumped over into 13, got a little more information about it, but I am saying this faith is, again, I'm pretty dogmatic about it, but I might be wrong. This faith is not salvation faith. This faith is not growing faith. This is faith that is serving the community of believers. And, not, and again, don't feel bad if you're one of them that looks at the mountain and turns and goes this way. Why did you do that? Because that's a huge mountain. That's just, the only person that can stand there and stare at that mountain is someone that's empowered by the Spirit of God. So don't feel bad. Well, I should have done that. You can't. It's humanly impossible to stand and stare at that mountain. You need faith by the Spirit of God who says, I'm here to serve the body of Christ through you. You keep staring at the mountain and we're going to move that thing. Now understand, the person that's doing that is many times going to have a lot of rejection because we can't move the mountain. And, and, but, and part of that gift of the faith right there is to take that social rejection and say, we can't move the mountain and say, no, and just keep, keep looking at it. Okay, I mean, we could go on and on. That's kind of an exciting subject. Okay. Uh, to another, the gifts of healing. And again, in the Greek, healings there is plural. Now, now we're, in, now we're also, now we just crossed into a line where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Now we're talking about gifts that have passed away. Okay, now, <laughs> right. That's, that's the safe, you know, pew view. It's like, well, we can, we can talk about wisdom. We can talk about knowledge in our Sunday school class. And we can also talk about faith moving mountains. Uh, but now, gifts of healing, that's kind of immediate. You know, you can't, if you're either sick or you're not sick, you're either healed or you're not healed. You either have the gift of healing or you don't. And you've either prayed for somebody or not, and it's either happened or it hasn't happened. And so it's like a little more, yeah, well, anything that we can actually touch, judge, or evaluate, uh, that's passed away. We want to say in the abstract area. Knowledge, wisdom, faith, you know. Uh, but anything that's really like hands-on happening right now, well, that, that passed away in the first century. And we can all just sit here. You can go there if you want to, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through chapter 13 where a lot of people go. If you don't mind, I'm going to go over and show you where it's at. Chapter uh, 13, verse 8. 
<clears throat> and I'll, I'll explain this in greater detail when we get there. But now, I guess what I'm doing is whenever we talk about gifts, this is going to come up. Because there are gifts that they're using in the Old Testament, using in the New Testament, manifesting in Jesus' ministry, manifesting in the early church. And also we look at, well, where are those gifts today? I don't know. I mean, they're still here. We don't see them. They're not written about. Uh, they're, they're secret. They've passed away. We don't have enough faith. Uh, they're only for the early church. Those are all possible answers. Here's Paul's answer. And even after I read this, it's kind of like, what did he just say? Chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, where there are prophecies, they will cease. Now, if you want to do some study, linguistic studies and exegetical studies right here, there's volumes been written around the verb and the wording right here, the verb tense, these words right here. And people build entire doctrines on those verbs, rightfully so. But, I mean, you've got to deal with it. But prophecies, they will cease. Now, the question is what? When is will? Was it 70 A.D., 95 A.D., 350 A.D.? or sometime in the future yet. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Again, when? They will. To say, well, tongues will never stop is a false statement. Biblically, tongues will be still. Prophecy will cease. It says it right here. But the question that we need to talk about is when. If it was at 70 AD, 95 AD, or is it sometime yet in the future? Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Oh, I really hope that hasn't gone already. Uh, but then again, what is knowledge? Is that supernatural knowledge, the gift of knowledge, or just knowledge in general? Some would say it passed away, you know, with the, you know, sometime in the 1960s with the arrival of the Beatles and rock and roll music. But, <laughs> okay, it, it, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Now that's an important thing to understand. Even the gifts we use today, we're only using them in part and we're only using them and prophesying in part. In other words, we're still behind a veil and we're dealing with things we really can't sometimes touch or see and we're manifesting spiritual realities in our present age which we really can't wrap our minds around. Now here, here's the, here for me, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker right here. We know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the, the imperfect disappears. Now what do we got to do? We know they'll pass away, and now we've just been told when they will pass away. When will they pass away? When perfection comes. And that is the word teleos. Uh, it means when everything is finalized, brought together. It's perfection. It's complete. It's back in line. Alignment has been made. When perfection comes, then all these imperfect manifestations are set aside because we no longer need them. And then Paul goes on and talks about when I was a child, I needed things that a child needs. I played with things that a child plays. I was interested in things. But when I became an adult, I realized I don't need those little toys. I'm not entertained by that anymore. I'm moving on to something of a greater understanding. And he's talking about that in the Christian life, in church history, in, in eschatology, what's he referring to? But he says, the church is the same way. There's a time when you play with little kids' toys. You needed them. You were entertained by them. But when perfection comes, you're going to lay these things aside because you have something real. You have something better. He says, right now, I, I look through a mirror, a glass, and I can't see clearly. But then it's going to be removed. I'll see face to face. It'll be clear when perfection comes. And you won't need these things. So indeed, some of these manifestations of these gifts are going to pass away. The question is when. Paul tells you the answer is of to when is teleos, when perfection comes. There it hangs, when perfection comes. Now, now the question, when does perfection come? When, when the last apostle died. Okay, that's an answer. Uh, when the Bible was completely written. Okay, there's an answer. When the Bible was canonized, when they recognized what the Bible was. Now you've pushed up to 350, 325 A.D. Uh, when, when the church reaches maturity, when all of a sudden the church university is walking in teleos. We as a body in history are not there yet, but someday we're going to be walking in perfection. We're going to mature. And that's some day, date in the future before Jesus returns. Or is this when Jesus returns? And when John talked about when we see him face it, when we see him as he is. 
then you'll no longer need all these temporary toys because you are there seeing him face to face. Is it upon death or is it an eschatological term when he returns to the earth? You understand what I'm saying? We'll talk about that more. I'm just hanging it out there because we now we've just mentioned healings. And this is such a radical, I don't want to say radical, but such a, oh, I know you want to say difficult. It's such a, an unknown because gifts of healing. There are groups that say they've passed away. The apostles needed them. The apostles needed the gifts of healing to confirm the word of God. How do we know you're teaching the word of God? Well, bring me some sick people. Heal, 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 heal. Is that impressive or what? Whoa, you must be speaking the words of God. Uh, don't you wish it was that simple? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can make it that simple. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said, let me show you some signs and wonders. And then all the crowd goes, ooh, ah, you are the son of God, and everything worked out. It's like Jesus did enormous miracles. It was, it was worthless, basically. So, again, I, I'm going to go off on that in, in a couple of weeks. So are the gifts of healing just for the apostles to confirm that they've got the word of God? Maybe, and that means they're passed away. Okay, let's assume, though, that they're still here today. And you can go to meetings and people have healing lines and people are falling over and all of this. And I, listen, I speak, I, I speak sometimes judgmentally. I speak critically. I speak sarcastically. Uh, and, and it's not because I've got a bad attitude. Sometimes, sometimes I've got a bad attitude. I'm human. I've got a bad, I'm just ticked about something. Okay, so just, you know, I'm sorry. I apologize. But sometimes it's because I believed it. I went with it. I got down front with it. And it's like, I'm in the middle of it, and it's like, oh, I see what's going on. This is, this is not real. This is, you're, you're playing people. And I've been there, I've seen it, I've touched it. I can tell you stories that will bore you out of God. No, no, you'd like to hear them. But it's like, I'm not going to, I can tell you stories about things that we've seen. We, we've been there. And it's like, listen, if, and soon as you, soon as you cross that line and, and start making biblical statements, you're ostracized because now you're, you're, messing with the, you're messing with the magic act. You're messing with the show business. And one simple question, if really you are a, a faith healer and you can actually touch and heal people, yes, it's a gift of God. My gosh, I, I believe that. I believe the gifts of healing are still here. Let's go to the hospital and let's, let's raise people up. Let's walk up and down the hallways. Well, not everyone's got, not, not everyone's got faith. It doesn't matter. You've got the gift. You just touch them, they'll have faith. Well, that's not the way it works. You've got to come to my, my uh, auditorium. You've got to come to my, my show down at the Civic Center. You've got to wait and listen to about a 30-minute offering appeal. And then, then have some people come forward and they'll fall down. Look at the miracle. It's like, whoa, whoa, no, no. I'm talking about people getting up out of wheelchairs, not coming up and falling down on the floor. Well, who knows how to judge God? Well, I know how to judge God because he says right here, this is God. And this is weird. This is show business. Oh, I, 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 I discern a rebellious spirit here. It's like, yeah, and then I use some profanity and say, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm rebelling. This, this is junk. This is not the spirit of God. You're, you're manipulating people. And then I move away from Tulsa and come back to Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, now, the closest, you know, one, I'm not by any means endorsing Oral Roberts, although Tony worked on Oral's eyes, and she was down there with New Oral, and what's his name, Robert? Richard. Richard, Richard, thank you. And Lindsay, she was working in the clinic there, and they'd come in and have their eyes taken care of, and she'd talk to them and stuff. So I, I, but I'm not endorsing Oral Roberts, but he would, he would be one that would be the closest, or not, because what did he do? He actually had this ministry... And then he actually built a hospital. He built City of Faith. Ben was born. Ben was born in City of Faith. So I'm not saying he's right. I'd probably say he's, he's wrong in many areas. But he was the closest. says, okay, he actually believed this message. I'm doing the best I can on the road. But for those that I can't help on the road, I'm going to build a hospital. And we're going to bring in the professional doctors that have gone to medical school, that have faith. And we're going to put it together. He's going to take faith and medicine and put it together. It's like, okay, now we're talking. I mean, now, now at least you're not hiding off there, running around like some, I don't want to use a name. Uh, it's just, you know, mimicking. Okay, let's go back to the text, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. Because there you have it right here. There's two answers. It's like, well, it's passed away. We don't need to deal with it. Or it's still here. Where is it at? Where's the gifts of healings? And again, that word healings is plural, which in most commentators would understand it this way, is that not, you're not just a faith healer bringing your sick. 
It's almost like you have this vein of healing for a certain disease or healing. This is the gift of healing for that, a gift of healing for this. And it's some kind of a manifestation. Not so much to alleviate, I don't know, not so much just to alleviate everybody's misery, but again, some kind of a confirmation sign. It's a gift to, to heal people. Jesus didn't just go around, well, it was his compassion, but there was people he walked by that he didn't heal. Sometimes he used it to confirm his message. Sometimes he used it because of his compassion for the crowd. So how are you going to put this down? I, I don't, I, again, I'm going to come to this point right here where I'm going to just ramble for a while and say, I don't really know. But here it is. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. So as surely as you've got wisdom and knowledge and faith, there is within the church those that have the gift of healing. Now, do you have to lay hands? doesn't say nothing about laying hands on it. What kind of healing? Is it, is it counseling? Is it just prayer? Praying for, for, from a distance. Do you have to have a, a meeting with an auditorium full of people and a 30-minute offering at the beginning and the end of the service to get there? Or can you just pray for someone from across the world somewhere else and your prayer does it? Do you, do you need to touch them? Do you need to visit them? Are they visiting hospitals today? I, I don't know. Are they medical doctors? Are doctors manifest? Someone say, well, it is. As we advance in science, medicine, and, and, and it, but I don't think that's it. I think we're talking about something more supernatural that's manifesting in Corinth. That's enough of that. We'll bump to that again. To another, the gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, miraculous powers. If you thought that was tough, here's this one. Miraculous powers. And what is miraculous powers? That means powers. That means dunamis. Miraculous means, again, something out of the ordinary. It's power that is coming out of nowhere. It's miraculous power to, to do some kind, something that is like completely unnormal, it's un, un, unnatural. It's like that was a manifestation of the power of God that did, again, whatever it would be. We can try to find some examples of this in Scripture. I'm, I'm going to try and read through this list. We'll have to pick this up next week. I'm sorry we didn't get very far. To another prophecy, when we get into chapter 12 further on, uh, we're going to have a, a, quite a bit of talk about prophecy and what prophecy is. Distinguishing between spirits. Oh, man, I really, I got to quit, but I want you to see this on these notes here. We got to pick this up on page two next week. I'm going to just pick up with the notes. If you look on page two <clears throat> for a little heads up, prophecy on page two on the notes I handed out, it would be page six of the old notes. Prophecy, you can see right there at the top of the page. 1 Corinthians 14, 3 says, Prophecy is to build up, encourage, and comfort believers. That's what prophecy does. Now, there's three views, basically. The third view, number C, is that prophecy is equal to uh, preaching and teaching the written word. In other words, when I'm standing up here teaching and preaching the word of God, that's prophecy, they would say. I don't think so. That's pre preaching and teaching, I think, the text of Scripture. Prophecy seems to be something more supernatural where you're receiving some kind of direction or revelation from God. Uh, it, I wouldn't say it's possible where you can be teaching and then have a prophecy inserted while you're teaching that you can begin to speak prophetically now that you stop talking normal and start saying, thus saith the Lord God and start like that. But you'd, you'd insert something in a prophetic manner, something that's encouraging to the church or strengthening or builds them up, comforts them. Going backwards, number B, some consider this to be the same or evil to the Old Testament gift of prophets. And now we're talking, to, again, now be careful, prophets in the Old Testament, they weren't like always like Daniel talking about eschatology, you know, 77s and the beast coming out of this, you know, all these kind of things like this. It's like they were more talking to their culture saying, God's upset, you've gone too far, you need to get back to the text of Moses, or in our case, you need to get back to the scriptures, because judgment is coming and he's going to lay low this land, he's going to lay low, and they were prophesying, you can repent and go back, or you can march on in your confusion and be destroyed, because God, the prophet was there warning of judgment, not in the distant future, but, you know, I'm talking in the next four or five years, or in this generation, Jeremiah spoke that way, Isaiah, Hosea, they all spoke this way. Jesus spoke that way in 40 years. In this generation will not pass away until they see this temple come down. And sure enough, 30 AD, 70 AD, temple came down. So, but it does not seem to be, again, you, you judges, that that's what this is talking about. They're talking about prophets uh, in that sense. They're encouraging, building up, bringing words from God to build up his church. Not necessarily shouting at the pagan nations or shouting at the church because the church is not a nation like Judah was a nation. 
And then A, the first one there, words, thought, or revelation that God supernaturally reveals to a person's spirit, soul, or mind. These thoughts are then spoken publicly in an understandable way. And now it's, it's not really Bible teaching, but it's more of just edification, speaking, encouraging, but being uh, uh, motivated by the Spirit of God. Somewhere in there is the gift of prophecy. And we're going to see, and we get to chapter 14, that there's several prophets in the congregation speaking, and if one prophet is speaking and another has a word, the first prophet stops, and this person begins to speak. In other words, the church was not like this, where one person's standing up talking the entire time. We're sharing ideas, almost like a group discussion, and they're prophesying. But at the same time, what's completely different, I've got to quit, is that the spirits, or that the prophets were judging each other. In other words, Jeremiah's message was not open for debate. He says, I'm speaking, and who's going to defend this is God when he does exactly what I say. You can judge me if you want to, but it doesn't matter. I'm moving this way. The prophets in, in Corinth were judged by each other. If this prophet speaks, the other prophets listen and go, mm, yeah, no, yes, no, next one. And they would accept it. They were rejecting, the prophets were rejecting and accepting the prophecies they were giving to each other, which leads to the next verse, which is the discerning of spirits, which we'll pick up again this next week. And that is where you're judging and discerning between what spirit just manifests. Yes, that was a prophecy. That was a supernatural utterance. That came from some attitude, but... Now someone's looking at that saying, yeah, that, I can tell you what that was. That was the spirit of Christ rebuking his church. Or no, that was a demonic spirit. That was an angry spirit, something. You're just ticked that you didn't get the promotion at the church or something, whatever. You see what I'm saying? I mean, they can discern. That's the discerning of spirits. And I've got some examples. Acts 16, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Thessalonians 5. Even there it says, discern, uh, treat prophecies with... Uh, you can read it right there. I'll pick it up next week. I'm rambling now. I've been rambling for an hour. I'm going to quit. Okay. <laughs> We'll pick this up next week, and we seem like we're, we keep getting uh, going three steps forward and two steps back, but uh, we'll get through this. Thank you for your patience. I'm going to pray, and always, always listen to what I say, but always be judgmental, critical, and, and, and bring it in alignment with what you understand to be the truth, because the Word of God is the truth. I'm just trying to communicate uh, some insights into it, and I'm well open. I'm on well, well, it's very necessary that you judge what I say. Thank you for being here. Father, we do thank you again for your truth. We thank you for your word. We do ask that we may hear and understand these things, that we would be able to apply them to our lives. We ask that we might be greater, stronger, more productive Christians in our own private lives. But, Father, also as members of the body of Christ here in, in Des Moines and universally, that we'd be able to contribute to the needs of the church and help the cause of Christ to be advanced in this earth. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be here at this time in history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.